you know, the best way to do it is to make sure that your free content is far superior than other people's paid content. So if you're out there going, this is what you need to do. I'm not trying to sell you the property. Hey, I'm not even going to show you the property. But I'm demonstrating on what it's taking me to make this an irresistible offer, to make this a place that you can see yourself in. This is what I'm going through. You're now making yourself a resource. And people want to deal with resources. People want to deal with the best of the best. People want to deal with people they know, think of the answers before you've come up with the question. Today we have Steve Sims, the founder of Bluefish, one of the top personal concierge services and an expert marketer within the luxury industry. He makes impossible possible. After all, he's quoted as the real life Wizard of Oz by Forbes and Entrepreneur Magazine. Get out of the way of yourself. Uh, there's a lot of this bullshit about, well, you know, we've done this because that's why we've always done it. <laughs> um, and as we know nowadays, let's be blunt, you know, we're not doing things the way we always did it because what we did last year doesn't fucking exist anymore. You know, it's completely irrelevant. So um, as I started getting more into the mortgage world, I was finding that while they were hiding behind the, oh, regulations are this and we can't do this. It's the same shit, just with a different different banner. Uh, and meanwhile, while that stood there in the quagmire and sinking, going, oh, we can't do that because of qu purple bricks, Amazon, you know, uh, quick, quick. And all of these people are coming up. They're just going, well, fuck you. You know, we're just going to make it easy for people. So while you're worrying about it, we're going to do it. And that's exactly what I talk about with real estate agents. I said, the only reason that the disruptors are coming in is because you're allowing the story you. to be, you're the allowing the story to be written in that way. They're saying that you're lazy. They say you don't do anything. They're saying you have a lot of excuses. They say yep. you don't work. They say you stay at home all day. And uh, not only do they say that, but they also put video of that. They put ads together for that. And they say, hey, look, why would you go there? When you can just come with us, we'll do the exact same thing that they do. We'll charge less and we'll make it super easy for you. Okay, well, a consumer looks at that and they go, great, sounds like a great option. And the only reason that is happening is because the agents and mortgage professionals and tons of people in the real estate industry as a whole, they're just adding to that same story of, you know, it's super easy. Look, I just sold one, two, three Main Street, you know, but they don't show what they do. They don't show all of the hard work that goes into it. They don't show the behind the scenes. They don't show no. anything. They go, just listen, just sold it in four days. Okay, well, a consumer looks at that and they go, man, it was four, four days. Did they really even work hard? Did they do anything? Like, do they deserve the money? Yes. Yeah, no, exactly. There's a lot of confusion over that side. And the biggest enemy of the real estate world is the realtors for not educating the client on what they're actually doing. Exactly. Um, that is weird. It's a weird one out there. So we've got a, it's, it's an industry that needs to be shaken up before it dies. Definitely. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was talking to Dave Savage the other week and he, he, he coined it best. You've got to do everything Amazon does and everything Amazon doesn't. Um, and too many people at the moment are trying to compete, compete Apple for Apple with Amazon. And you ain't going to win. No. Nope. So you, you've got to show why you're different and why you're worth it. I think that the, the only reason that the stories are being written by other people is just because people aren't writing their true story or they're doing the same things over and over or they're just doing the things because they were told this is what worked 30 years ago. And um, at the heart of most of the stories that they put out there, it's not, it's not them. It's not their authentic self. It's not their true self. It's not what they would really say. And you know, we're a huge advocate on attracting the type of clients that you want to work with because mm. I use uh, this theory that I've come up with is called the law of the bullseye. And when you think of law of the bullseye, instantly you think of, okay, it's something about hitting the bullseye. Well, it's actually drastically opposite. I say that if I were to give a dart to most real estate agents and say, the bullseye is a $10 million listing and the outer rings are $100,000 listings, which one would you go for? They go, well, I'd go for the $10 million listing. I said, if the $10 million listing is going to give you stress, anxiety, divorce, you're going to have a lot of issues. That person will never refer you ever again. You're going to hate waking up. You're going to hate everything that you do. Would you still go for it? And go, well, $10 million listing. Yeah, $10 million listing. <laughs> if I told them if they would have hit the outer rings, they would have got a much lower listing, but it would have been their best friend who would have given them a referral. <laughs> they would have done the things they liked and they would have attracted more people organically and that person would have also referred them more clients because they're now working with people who like the things they like, do the things they do, and they're showing their true selves through social media, not this, you know, I put on a suit and tie, which everybody knows. Jonathan Hawkins does not put on a suit and tie. If I were to put a suit and tie in and come in social media, my people would be like, 
is he going to a funeral? Like something's wrong. They just know that he's not going to do that. Uh, what would be a piece of advice that you would give to somebody that uh, is portraying somebody else through social media when they should be train, portraying, excuse me, their own authentic self? Well, first piece of advice is stop. <laughs> okay. um, you see, the trouble is we're, we're, in a, we're in a world where we are the slowest evolving technology. And we're seeing all this technology, which is leading us to believe in AI, simulation, um, uh, um, VR, uh, all of these photoshops. We're, we're growing up in a world of fake. And social is, is at the key of that. You know, people will walk past someone else's car, lean on it, take a shot and go, life's a yellow Lamborghini and imply that it's theirs. And you know, jack shit, it isn't. You know, I saw in Burbank the other week a banner where um, advertising you could actually rent the planes uh, for photo shoots, uh, for selfies, Instagram, <laughs> social. Increase your population by booking this jet for a 20-minute shoot and, and the plane won't take off. It won't even start the engines. It'll open up. You can walk to it. And I've seen people doing it. And so I think we're getting smart now. I think we're actually distrusting things. Now, the downside is, as human beings, I mentioned, we're the slowest evolving technology. We, at our core, want to connect. We want to find people that stimulate us. We want to be attracted to people. We get scared of things. We run away. We get attracted to things. We go forward to it. That's our core. And it hasn't changed for hundreds of thousands of years. Now people are trying to go, oh, but if you put a shiny suit on, you'll look better. No, we are starting to distrust things on a regular basis. The old, analogy, the old saying about, oh, if it looks too good to be true, oh, it probably is. You know, we're looking at all this social now and we're not trusting it, which is causing us a distraction when we're actually speaking to people. When you come forward, just like you and just like me, when we come forward, as the old, the old grandma saying, warts and all, we go, look, life's not rosy. You know, I, I do slip up. I do bleed when I, when, I, when I, you know, scrape my knee. I do make mistakes. It costs me money, you know. Living is an education normally on what not to do, but we can only get up by learning, you know, to fall down first. Um, and I feel that when people put on all these trinkets of success, the big watch, the even adding filters, you know, I'm a great believer in don't add a filter to cool, you know, just show it as it actually is, the real warts and all. People will relate to it. Now, we've seen these, these magazines that you flick through, and we don't even notice it anymore because you see this beautiful woman, she's been photoshopped. If you analyzed it, you'd realize that her legs have been stretched and she's actually 12 foot tall. <laughs> you know, because of Photoshop. Yeah. Now we're in a world where we want to go, well, we want to learn about these, you know, we want to see the perfect imperfections. It's different. You know, you may see a little blemish on someone and you may go, oh, that's cool. You know, and someone else may go, well, that's ugly. But we are not being allowed to give that decision because people are Photoshopping it because they look at it as an imperfection. I have a great saying that I love, perfection is in your imperfections. And I think you've got to get out there and be real, be relatable. This word of, um, and I hate it, you mentioned it already, makes me cruel, authentic, okay? If I say, hey, you've got to meet Johnny, he's really authentic. That's just a way of me acknowledging that most of the planet is not. And that's upsetting, okay? Because it tells people are settling for the bullshit. I, I love this word transparency, I want to know what you're about. I want to know what you stand for. I know. I want to know what makes you tick. I want to know what you like, what you dislike. Do you drink whiskey too much? Do you like playing with your dogs? Do you go out with your kids to football? I want to know all of those things so I can make an educated decision on whether or not you're the kind of person I want to deal with. And that's the same with the real estate world. You know, we've got all of these posters that are sitting on every bloody bench by a bus stop from some girl that had her photograph taken 30 bloody years ago, like she was trying to try out for some kind of soft porn movie. <laughs> and it's wrong. Yeah. I want to know that you're a real person. You turning up in a Rolls Royce and trying to act as though you're flashing at me is only going to make me want you to go, go away. So I want people to be normal. I think people are constantly searching. I think with the advance of all technology and AI and VR and all these kind of things, we're desperately hunting for that now. And I think this gives the, the realtors, the mortgage, anyone in a person-to-person -person industry, it gives them the opportunity now to stand up and go, hey, I'm real, just like you.
I've made mistakes, but those mistakes have given me the education that I need to help you avoid those in what you want to do here. And so I'm a great believer, get rid of it. Don't try to dress for somebody else. Be you, be relatable, be transparent. Don't try to make out you're smarter than you are. Be as smart as you actually are, and people will appreciate that. Yeah, and and you have to make sure that you're doing that from the beginning and setting the clear expectations where if somebody were to go on your social today and you meet with them in a month, they already know about you. You don't want to do that. You know, I think a lot of agents are, they're, they're trying to lead generate. How do I get more leads? How do I get more leads? They then go to a table just like this and they talk about their phenomenal listing presentation and, you know, they're hoping just sign here, just sign here, just sign here. And then they get into this selling process and they get into you know doing the things that they're going to actually do to sell a house. And that's when the client starts learning about that person. Well, and that's where a lot of issues arise. It is. And the issues <laughs> actually start just before them because let's, let's break that down. For a start, one of the things I teach is to do a social audit. Okay. Nowadays, if you, if you introduce you to sell, yourself to someone and say, Hey, how you doing? I'm Steve Sims. Yes, you're going to give them your website, but most people don't look at that website because the website is there just to show you pictures that I want you to see. My best media, my best things I'm going to put on this website is my platform to expose the better bits of me, okay? People actually go on a social now. Social is being used far more than Googling someone. Do you remember when you used to Yahoo for someone? (laughs) You know, times change. Now you Google them. And you go onto social, you look them up on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and on there, it shows who the person is, okay? It shows the real person potentially. Now, I talk about the social audit because I tell people, open up all of your social pages, okay? On a screen, preferably a desktop, not a laptop because it's usually a bit too small, but on a desktop, open up all different browsers, have your LinkedIn, your Twitter, your Snapchat, your Instagram, your Facebook, your Tinder, whatever, okay? Put all your social profiles open. And then you look on LinkedIn, and you're on there in a suit, kind of like, you know, slightly profiled, facing off slightly 45 degrees with your chest, it's all photoshopped, and then you get over to Facebook, and this girl's gone wild. There's a, there's a confusion, So whatever you're posting on Facebook, whatever your tone of voice is on Facebook, that's the one you use on Twitter. That's the one you use on LinkedIn. Don't confuse the end client, okay? Because they're looking around going, can I relate to that person? And they're seeing two different profiles and they're already getting confused. Now, if you've got a profile and and it's, it's never too late, that's the beautiful thing, it's never too late. If you've got different profiles, get in there and change them. Okay, if you've got followers on there already, you can turn around, you can do a posting and go, hey, I'm putting a full stop on this. I've noticed over the years that I've tried to be someone that I'm actually not. So here it is. I like dogs. I like walks along the beach and I like apple pies. For all of those that like those things, welcome. Stay with me. For those that don't, I respect that I may have misled you. I wish you all the best. I'm sure we'll both be fine. So you can actually draw a line on the sand. You can refresh it and say what states. Now, your social is an indicator. It is not a sales banner. I've noticed a lot of um, realtors, for argument's sake, that, you know, you go onto their Facebook page and it's like, you know, apartment, bungalow, apartment, you know, bluff, bluff home. It's a ranch house. It's just house, house, house. It's buy, 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 buy. Okay? And usually with that, the client says bye, bye. You've got to educate. You've got to engage. You've got to entertain. If every single one of your your postings is selling something or just telling me how bloody excellent you are because you just sold a house in four days for multiple offers, you're actually doing the wrong things. If you sold a house in four days for multiple offers, how did you do that? What happened behind the scenes? What made it so special for you? Because... The naysayers out there are going, well, if you sold it in four days, hell, I could have gone to Purple Bricks and saved money, you know, because obviously there wasn't a lot of effort in it. So you've got to be able to demonstrate and say, hey, I sold this in four days for multiple offers. Let me tell you how I did it and why an agent is there to get you those multiple offers. Let me show you, let me educate you on what it takes. And in doing that, you're building up the value. People moan about price points. People should never moan about a price point. If someone's moaning about a price point, it's your fault. It's because you've not demonstrated the value that they receive. 
So if anyone ever goes, oh, that's too expensive, that's your fault. It's not theirs, that's your fault. There was multiple things that I would love to to dive in, but I think we'd uh, be spending the night here. <laughs> uh, one of those was a, a great point. A lot of people say, well, you know, I've been doing it this way for so long. How do I change? And the, the easy thing is, is like you said, do, do a post. This is what we're going to be doing moving forward. This is what I like. This is who I am. You know, do a video that describes who you are, what you do, show people exactly what that is, and they'll either resonate with it or not. And if they don't, more than likely, well, they weren't going to add any business to you anyways. They weren't going to refer you another client because the moment that they would have found out who you truly were, they would have said, I didn't know you liked those things. I didn't know you were that person. And I think that, you know, there's too many people, no matter the industry, that are just trying to, you know, just garner all this business with everybody out there when they really don't garner any business because they're just too spread out. They're trying to be everything to all people. And, you know, that really doesn't work. We kind of just jumped into talking. I wanted to to read your bio because it was a phenomenal bio that either you or your assistant filled out. And uh, uh, there's a couple of touching points that I wanted to, to dive into there. So as the founder of Bluefish, one of the top personal concierge services and, and an expert marketer within the luxury industry, Steve has been quoted in various publications and TV Articles including the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, London, Sunday Times, South China Morning Post, and many more. Best-selling author of Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen. Sought-after consultant and speaker at a variety of networks, groups, and associations, as well as the Pentagon of Harvard twice. Want to sing with your favorite rock star? Be serenaded by Andrea Bocelli, which I would love to do that. Walk the red carpet at an A-list Oscar party. Get married at the Vatican. Dive into the wreck of the Titanic. These are just a few of the highlights that Stim... Ex, stim. I can't stim. even say... That. It's my that new name, Stim. stim S- Steve and Sims put together. What's Stim? <laughs> These are just a few <laughs> highlights of what Steve has been able to provide for his clients. He makes the po- impossible possible... After all, he's quoted as the real-life Wizard of Oz by Forbes and Entrepreneur Magazine. As an entrepreneur in the truest sense of the word, Steve is well-regarded within the luxury world for his innovation and down-to-earth personality. Known for his honesty, integrity, and doing things his way, Steve creates experiences for his clients that they could have never imagined being possible so this is STEM. We're giving you the nickname STEM. Steve Sims is STEM. <laughs> and hopefully that will resonate with people. So, you know, I read this bio and I love reading people's bios, but I think that, you know, people are obviously a lot more than what their bio can fit in. If somebody were to ask you, who is Steve Sims? What would you say to them? Uh, he's an annoying four-year-old from East London. Um, I think my wife actually jokes about it. You know, I come from an Irish background. Uh, my family were, were construction workers, and I came from the 80s. I, I didn't even know what Gucci, Prada, I didn't even know what any of these things were. So I was completely ignorant to that world of luxury. You know, if we got a new car, it meant that it was under 15 years old. Uh, it was that kind of thing. So um, I was the inquisitive little Paddy that just wanted to kind of like get into the club, you know, when I shouldn't be and get into this party. And, you know, I was the, the, the professional gate crasher. I was just one of these little annoying, uh, curious kids. As I got older, the concierge industry allowed me to get curious and get paid. So people were like, well, I'd like to do this without one join. I'd be like, oh, I wonder where I can do that. And then I would do it. And then, uh, you know, on Joe Bocelli and all these other things. So I became, it gave me a platform to allow my curious nature to continue. And then I got into the marketing and the branding, which again was another curious way of going, hey, how are you doing things? And why are you not doing these things? Um, so I would say that if people didn't know me, uh, and then just met me, they would just find me this um, annoying, probably slightly dull character because I live vicariously through my clients. But um, I just like to kind of like find out, well, how does that work? You know, where's this? Like you, you, you've got a soundboard there and I'm looking at all the buttons at the back and I'm thinking, oh, what's that one doing? What if I push that? And, you know, I'm just that curious little kid. My wife often says I'm a 53-year-old, four-year-old. So for somebody that is very curious, do you often find yourselves going in tons of different directions or how do you stay focused on on doing the things that you said generate business for you and focusing on your clients? I kind of think they're both the same. Okay. For, for a start, I've never given a client anything that they asked for, okay? Because if you do that, Amazon's going to take your job next next week, okay? okay? So 
My job is to listen to what you want, give you what you need, give you what you desire, give you what you lust for. And there's, that's always behind the request. Someone will turn around and go, oh, I'd love to do this. And you can go, well, that's nice. But why? Well, you know, because I've always wanted to do it. I said, yeah, but seriously, if I, if I pull that off and you do that, is that going to wake you up at 2 o'clock in the morning in a cold sweat going, oh, my God, I can't believe I did that? Is that really going to be it? And they'll be like, well, yeah. but what if we did this and then we did this? Or what about if we did this in this setting? You know, are you open to seeing what can be done? Now, if I can get the yes on that, then I get to go and play. So someone will come to me, the, the Bocelli thing for argument's sake. Um, a client came to me, he wanted a restaurant in Florence. And uh, he wanted to impress his uh, fiance and her mum and dad. Okay. So I went, oh, okay, then, you know, how far do you want me to go? He said, he's got to be memorable. All right. If I got you a restaurant in Florence, how memorable would that be? You know, Tuscan food's great. You'd have a good time. That'd be it. You wouldn't even remember the name. Sure, shit wouldn't remember that I put it together. So then I turned around and went, okay, and that's where I go scattergun. What can I do that I would like to be involved in? I'm now giving my, myself permission to dream and explore. So we ended up looking at Florence and going, well, okay, if you were going to go to Florence and you were going to have dinner, where would it have to be that when you came home, you would not need to say where it was? If, if we were in France and we went out for a picnic and in the back of the picture is the, the Eiffel Tower, you know you're in Paris. You could not replicate that anywhere else in the world. Why? Because there's a stonking great structure behind you. So looking at Florence, we found some beautiful museums, the Afusi that had all the Renaissance in there. If you were in there, you could have been in Paris. You could have been in Germany. You know, it wouldn't have been instantly identif ident identifiable as Florence. So um, I contacted the Accademia de Galleria in uh, Florence that houses Michelangelo's David. Now, David is only in Florence. It's nowhere else. The statues are, you know, the replicas, but the original Michelangelo's one is in, is in Florence. So we asked the museum, would they allow us to have a table of six at the feet of Michelangelo's David for dinner? And, um, you know, it was a little bit more difficult than that, but basically it was all to do with connections and getting the right kind of people to make... We pulled it off. So we took what the client wanted and wanted to see how far we could go. Now, I tried a few other venues, less than that, expecting that one to get a no. As soon as I got a yes on that one, I stopped doing what I do. So I went for a scattergun of the ridiculous, knowing that if I missed on the ridiculous, I would get the very good. But even the very good was 10 steps above what was acceptable to him. So... For me, this, this industry allows me to kind of like go, well, okay, how far can I go? And of course, every time I do this with the Pope, I do this with Elton John, I do this with Elon Musk, I do this with Richard Branson, I do this with Joe Polish. Anytime I get to do something with someone that a lot of people can't reach, my next meeting, my next adventure will be, well, okay, I've already done that. And as they always say, it's only impossible until you've done it. And then when you've done it, it's just routine. So then it's like, okay, how can I take this further? And that's that's what I like about my job. I've got this perpetual lust of kind of like, how far can I take it? How far can I push the boundary? Um, where is the boundary? Why is the boundary there? And what can I do beyond it? So that's really my kind of sense on how I do things. So I just push, scatter gun, give myself permission to dream uh, and challenge myself and then see what can be done. And when, when I do something that uh, raises the bar, that bar is my now new standard. Love it, because we talk to a lot of people uh, and a lot of business owners that have what I would call an 80-20% model, meaning they give 80% out knowing that the client has to come back for the other 20, which uh, at the truest of things, they, they know that they're not really serving the client because they're not really providing what they could provide. They're not mm. really showing them what is possible? A lot of people come to me and I say, hey, look, the best thing that could happen for you is you come to me and we work on whatever it is that you want to work on. But then we also do this, this and this that you didn't even know was possible. So that way you make so much more money that you you don't need me. Well, a lot of owners, they say, well, that's crazy because, you know, if you do it that way, then they're not going to come back to you. And I said, no, if I drastically surpass their expectations they're coming back because they want to know what else is possible 
What got, else can I do? That's the and then thing. they're telling all of their friends, I came to, I wanted to set up a Facebook ad. And next thing you know, he's got this computer doing this. And somehow this device, he put this in the middle of a city and it was pinging all these people. And I didn't even know this. Was, and okay. And I, and then I go back to the other guy and I go, it looks like I just got all of your clients because somehow they're coming my way because I'm, I'm over delivering on what they even thought was possible, which is exactly what you're doing in your business model, right? Yeah, you find you've got to find a. <laughs> nowadays, we want to find a who, not a how. Um, in the old days, you know, you wanted to you wanted to do something. You had to kind of like study courses, and you had to do stuff. There was so much information out there. There were so many experts out there. Now, the key should be finding a who, not a how. And when you found that who, that's the person that does all the thinking for you. That's the person that does all the dreaming. That's the person that puts in the structure. I'm a great believer that. Um, the client doesn't know what they don't know. That's your job. So if you can take the thought process out of a client, if you can go, hey, you wanted X, Y, I gave you X, Y, A, B, C, and the rest of the freaking alphabet without you asking for it, then they then they switch off. Then they go, you're my who. You know, I don't need to think anymore. I've outsourced my thinking to you. And people want that. People want to know that it's easy. The whole point is they want uh, ease, they want comfort, they want reliability, they want to know that it's done, and they want to know that you're thinking for them, not rather than giving. That's the problem we always had. When you needed something done, and you went on to like Odesk or Fiverr or something like that, and you go, hey, I want blah, 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 blah. You are di dictating what the person needs to do. They do what you've dictated, and then you're disappointed. Because they didn't think, okay? You weren't paying them to think. You were paying them to do. You've got to find those people that think, are creative. You've got to find the who, not the how. And you're right. You, if you can find that person, then they start going off to their people going, I don't need to think about my Facebook structure. I don't need to think about my my organic marketing. I don't need to think about how I do things. And, and that's good when you're a consultant and a coach as well because you're giving the clients permission to be them. And it's daft because we're all in business. And it doesn't matter what business you're in, everyone's business wants to identify themselves as unique, as special, as the golden child. Well, we were always unique and special. And then for some reason, we decided 20 years ago to bloody dilute ourselves and start looking like everyone else, behaving like everyone else, talking like everyone else, wearing like everyone else. So the whole point now is to get rid of all of that, get them back to being original, Get them back to being unique and identifying what it is that makes them unique. And nine times out of 10 is their ability to think and care. And those things are what's going to get you a client every single time. That 80, 20% rule, that is such a bitch. I, I've heard that so many times. And anyone that still uses it, you know, start filing a resume somewhere, you know, because you, you're going to be bankrupt soon. And with the more jobs that are being taken over, you know, you're going to be you're going to be flipping me burgers and giving me a coffee as, as I drive through. You've got to identify yourself as a thinker because all of the technology at the moment coming out, it it does it actions on your request. None of it creates, none of it thinks, none of it dreams. That's still the advantage that we've got over all of the the purple bricks, Amazons, Quicken, everything that we've got. It's our ability to dream. And then to actually do something about it, we are creative, and so we got to focus on our strength there. Yeah, no, and, and, and it's. I think I digressed. A, no, a no worries. Million miles. Don't worry, there. I do the same thing every day. <laughs> <laughs> on the car right here, we are going through our calendar and different things, and next thing you know, we're starting talking about drastically opposite. <laughs> Happens every day, and I tell people if you don't like it, then you probably shouldn't talk to me because I'm going to keep doing this, and I'll oh, go yeah. on rants this way and that way, and somehow, good, good, good. At, at least in the back of my mind, I know exactly what I'm thinking <laughs> about, and we'll put it all together. And next thing you know, we're diving with great white sharks, and that's exactly what happened last year when. We were trying to put a, a mastermind together, but I don't want to go to a hotel and I don't want to, you know, talk about the exact same things that you're doing in your market and that we can do in our market and all these different, that doesn't excite me. I'm like, okay, what can really get me excited? And, you know, somebody threw out the idea, like, let's do it on a boat. I'm like, okay, you know, don't really see things happening on a boat. I'm like, well, what if we did it on a boat with great white sharks around us? They're like, well, you know, yeah, oh yeah, great white sharks. I'm like, 
no, that can happen. You know, people go great white shark diving, right? That's a thing. I'm like, okay, well, let's go great white shark diving to the number one place in the world with the most great white sharks all around us at the highest point where they have the most amount of sharks. Uh, the, 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 the numbers dropped significantly <laughs> at that point, but we did it. And we were there for six days and it was phenomenal. And there wasn't a point of more than 10 minutes that we didn't have a great white shark within six to 10 inches away from us. Uh, we probably saw about 40 different sharks in total over six days. So it was great. But I think just thinking outside of the box, you know, a lot of people say, you know, how do you stay laser focused and how do you, you know, get to your goals? I think that a lot of gurus or experts out there that try to make you stay specifically on one line. Yeah, they have somewhat of a, uh, uh, a reason to say that. But if you don't get creative, if you don't think outside of the box and you never experience all of these things, you never start doing a podcast with people you never thought you would be doing a podcast with. You don't do really what's out there because you're only doing what other people have done. Yep. You're only experiencing the same thing that somebody else has done. Uh, and I think that, you know, being creative and allowing yourself to be creative is one way that just sets yourself apart from all of the noise that's out there of we do it, we do this and we do that and we sell houses and you know, it's, it's super easy. Work with us. We're number one. We're the best. Well, everybody else is saying that as well. Everybody's the best. Everybody's number one and everybody does it just as good as the next person. For somebody that wants to create a, an experience for their client and, and document that experience, if an agent is listening to this right now, what are some of the things that you see real estate agents doing uh, when it comes to creating an experience or documenting some of the things uh, that they're currently doing uh, and, and, and a piece of advice that you can give them to kind of shape it in a different way. Meaning everybody's listing a house, one, two, three, Main Street, the exact same ways. Yep. Okay. You could do it like this. So I'm going to, I'm going to come. We mentioned Joe Polish earlier. Yeah. Um, he actually came up with a fantastic statement. He, he's, he's a great mentor of mine, and he actually came up with a great statement that we're living in a world of mass distraction, and we are. Um, and everyone's either distractive and not focused or copying everybody else. And as you say, you know, one, two, three Main Streets for sale, and everyone goes, well, we've always done this, and we've always done this. I was working with an agent a while ago, and what we started doing is we started documenting the pre-sale, the marketing, and they almost made it like a little documentary, now, they never showed the address of the property because we wanted it to be educational and we wanted it to show what actually went into the process. So when they were in the kitchen, they were saying, look, you know what, as I've been selling properties, everyone says you need fresh coffee and you need flowers and you stuff like that. These are my favorite ones. These are what I did. These are my candles. These are my go-tos. And we'd, we'd document it on like a little video and Instagram's doing very well for that at the moment. IGTV is great. So they do a little video and they put it up there. And they go, hey, if you're out there trying to sell your home, think of the tips that I've given you. Think of this thing called curb appeal. You know, the inside of your property is fantastic, but no one can see behind the front door. So you've got to make sure you've got curb appeal. This is what good. A letterbox. If you've got a letterbox, make sure it's a beautiful white letter. They were focusing on those details. Now, what they were doing was they were following the three E's. Engage, educate, and entertain, okay? They were giving them education on what needed to be done to best help them. Now, again, as we said earlier, you know, the, the client comes to you and they want something. Now, you're showing that you can give them that, but you've got so much more. So in that education of, hey, the curb appeal, the cooking, the, the coffee, the, um, the back of the house, you know, where the bins are sitting during that period, the music is playing, you're educating the people not on so much what they should be doing, but the fact that you know this stuff. You know what to do. They don't have to think. People, believe it or not, don't like thinking. And you're now demonstrating that you know how to do it all for them because this is what you do. You're a professional at it. And I don't know the last time that Quicken ever went into a house and put the coffee on. There you go. So these people are documenting that. And then they're showing the entertainment. They're engaging it. They're showing the sunshine. They're showing the rain. You know, it's a rainy day. How can we make this look beautiful? Well, it's a rainy day. What do you want to do in a typical rainy day? You want to get into your home. How do you make this a, a, a beautiful 
place of just relaxation during a harsh, rainy day. You want to go into your safe place. I've heard people before say that you never want to show a house on a rainy day. Quite the opposite. If it's a rainy <laughs> day, where is there anywhere better to be than at home? And I, and yeah, a, a rainy day is perfect. I actually told my clients that all the time. I said, if it's rain, good. We want to see if there's any leaks going on. We want to see if there's issues. Oh, absolutely. I would rather it pour down on rain, pour down raining while we're in escrow to see if there's any issues. Because if not, you're going to call me in a few months and go, hey, it's raining. We didn't notice this. Great. Let it rain now. Let's pour water on the house. Everything <laughs> looks beautiful with a blue sun, uh, with a blue sky, doesn't it? You <laughs> it know, does. when, when it's when it's dim when it's you know you got bad rain pelting when it's a horrible day if this if the place still looks like a a sanctuary to you if it's still beautiful then it's only going to look even prettier when the sun comes out so yeah you want to look at something in its worst light to know that it's going to look even better in its best light so i'm a great believer that you want to you want to use the videos to educate the people on what needs to be done but subliminally, you're actually educating them on the fact that you know what needs to be done. And that's that 80-20 rule that you were talking about. If you go one step further, if I, I remember um, Jason Flatlin said, you know, the best way to do it is to make sure that your free content is far superior than other people's paid content. So if you're out there going, this is what you need to do. I'm not trying to sell you the property. Hey, I'm not even going to show you the property. But I'm demonstrating on what it's taking me to make this an irresistible offer, to make this a place that you can see yourself in, this is what I'm going through. You're now making yourself a resource. And people want to deal with resources. People want to deal with the best of the best. People want to deal with people they know, think of the answers before you've come up with the question. The way that I got started in real estate about five years ago, uh, <coughs> I grew to the rookie of the year in three months. And a lot of agents would come to me and go, how did you become the rookie of the year in three months? Well, I sold houses. Well, how are you selling houses? You've only had your license for three months. I'm showing people what I'm doing. I'm documenting all the things that the experienced people are doing, but they're not showing it to anybody. And so what I've done is I created what I called a certification package, right? So I'm coming to you with my certification process. It's all of the different things that we're gonna do to sell your, your property, which all of those things, most agents, if not all of the agents did, they just didn't have a package for it. Not only did I have it all packaged up and nice, but I had a video from the pre-sell, from the actual appointment of a, with a client, all the way to the very end, the pre-sell, the, the, uh, the escrow, the open houses, the, the inspections, the bad times, the good times. And when I went into a listing presentation, people would start asking me questions. That's normal. Well, what, what are you going to do to market our house? You know, what makes you stand out? And I go, phenomenal questions. Rather than me answering them for you, I'd like to just play a quick three minute video and I would click play. It would start from that very first appointment which was actually somebody else asking that question and then show them from there all the way to the very end exactly what I can do for them. Three minute video. At the end of the video, I said, do you have any more questions? And they would just like, you literally just answered every question. You do this, you do that. And, and again, it was good times. It was bad times. It was behind the scenes. It was not perfectly edited. It was my certification plan, I can do it for you. I never lost a listing if I was able to hit play across the table from uh, somebody. Anybody that works with me privately knows he's going to put a certification plan together for you. And they always think, well, I don't have that. And go, you have it. You just have not put it together. Yeah. You just haven't packaged it in a way where somebody thinks, what is this? It's, it's exciting. It's wow, there's so many things that this person does. Well, for the most part, you're already doing them. Now let's put the video behind it and show you working. Let's show you staying up till 10 o'clock at night, answering emails sometimes, which you do. Uh, you know, you don't have to put this uh, ribbon on all of your social posts and all these different things that you're doing to make it seem perfect because those people actually aren't going to work with you. They're going to go to somebody like Jonathan who was saying, Hey, it's not going to be easy, but I'm going to help you. And not only am I going to help you, but I also have this person who works with me. You know, if you need a psychologist, we got psychologist references. If you got this, like, and we had <laughs> this huge team of people, which again, most people have, I think we, you know, we, like I said, I get on rants and uh, <laughs> tangents all the time. We, we went over your bio. We talked about blue fishing. 
And um, we talked about some of the things that you've done. And uh, one of the things is you make the uh, impossible possible. How? That's easier than you think. First of all, not recognizing that it's impossible. Uh, too many people can like put these barriers in front of themselves, uh, these limits, and go, well, well, I can't do that. And well, why can't you? Because I've never been able to do it. it it's it, that's always been a problem. You know, it's, it's that kind of stuff. You know, it's the simple fact that if you tell yourself it can't be done, you're right. Um, so when people come to me and they say, "Oh, I want to do this," um, all right, you know, that that's the first answer. You know, all right, and then what's my first step? Um, and you just you just chip away. It's the old saying about how do you eat an elephant? You know, inch by inch. So I've never, ever seen anything as impossible. Now, also, you've got to bear in mind and rewind. I also told you I never give a client what they ask for. Now, two things are happening here, which I like. One, I'm going to ignore what you're asking for. I'm going to be working on what you need. Okay, that's the first thing. Secondly, most people don't actually tell me what they truly dream. They dilute it. You see, when you really want something, that, that's kind of brushing around on your core. People don't like to be that vulnerable. They don't want to be that open. They don't want to tell you how desperately they want this to happen because they've, they've wanted it for so many years that they just they just can't sleep when they think. Of, they don't want to tell you that. You know, they'll brush over and they go, yeah, th th this would be nice if I could do that. You know, I had a client, fellow 25K member, um, contacted me originally that uh, he wanted to meet the rock band journey. And I was like, oh, okay, fine. You know, why? And then in going through understanding why it was so important for him to meet the rock band, we realized very early on for him to just go backstage after a two hour sweaty show where they wouldn't remember his name by the time they got to the changing room was not going to do it. So I ignored him. I focused on what I needed to do. And he ended up actually singing live on stage with them. I think he sang uh, three or four tunes He's termed as the shortest lead singer of uh, the rock band Journey, live on stage, pyrotechnics, all of the all the smoke machines and everything down in San Diego. And so he actually got to be experienced as that singer. He was not meeting the band, forever he was part of the band. And we focused on what truly needed to happen rather than what was experienced. Now, you turn around to people and you go, oh, yeah, my client wanted to meet the rock band Journey. I stuck him on stage and he sang four tunes with him. And they, and they, even though I've bloody told them that, even though there's photographic evidence of that, they still go, oh, my God, that's impossible. <laughs> it's a neat, even though I've just shown you it's happened, you still can't believe it happened. So I'm stunned at that. And I think that's where, luckily, my lack of education came through. I think the fact that I was a 15-year-old kid that came out of school, started working on the building site, couldn't understand why it couldn't be done, you know, was ignorant to all of the uh, the paralysis that most people put on themselves. Um, I was a case of, well, I need to do this. All right, I'll go and do that. You know, it was just I couldn't fathom why it couldn't be done. I couldn't understand why I shouldn't be asking that question. It was the king's clothes. I think you call it the emperor's new clothes or something over here. But it was that typical story of me just going, well, why can't it be done? Oh, it's never been done before. Well, I didn't ask that question. I asked, you know, why can't it be? You know, why can't we do this? And people just go, well, because that's how we've always done it. Nothing we do today is how we did it 20 years ago or shouldn't be because there's other ways of doing it now. I see these brokers at the events I speak at and they go, oh, what's, what's going to be my biggest problem? I know it's Purple Bricks and I know it's Amazon. I, I know it's all of the Those are the people that are going to steal my job. Actually, no, it's not. It's the kid just coming into the business that isn't as jaded and as blinkered as you, sitting next to you, learning all of your experience and then doing things his way because he's never had the, the uh, shield or the, um, the backpack, the luggage on his shoulders that says, well, this is the way we've always done it. If we did it the way we've always been doing it, we'd be sending bloody faxes over a modem, <laughs> you know, one every like three minutes. We need to look at what needs to be done, forgetting how we've done it, and then going, what is the most impactful way of getting it through? Impact is a word that we haven't used here. 
yet you've used it in what you spoke about. Doing the videos, the, the normal videos, not walking in with a bloody film crew, not being mic'd up, but doing it in a raw setting, giving it the real ambience of this is me with my iPhone, showing you walking into the house for the first time, showing you the, the people doing the inspections on my iPhone. Now, let's be blunt. The iPhone's a fantastic camera now, you know, that we never used to have three years ago. You've got a bloody studio in your pocket now, and you should be using that for the best bet. The fact that it's slightly shaky, that makes it authentic, doesn't it? It makes it real. Um, so I believe now we should be doing those things. You talk about uh, authenticity. I talk about transparency. I talk about how to do things the most impactful way because that's going to leave the lasting result. That's going to be gripping the people. And that's going to be creating the trigger. Every time they see a little video, they're going to remember you. Every time they think about their house, they're going to remember you. Why? Because you showed you cared. You documented it. You answered the questions before they, they came up with the questions. So those kind of things are triggers. And it can only be done when it's in, in, impactful. And, and you, you did it. Don't get me wrong if you're listening to this, but when I would sit across the listening table to people, I would tell them all the time, if I'm a real estate agent in 30 years, I failed. And they would go, wait, wait, what? And I go, my goal is not to be a realtor in 30 years because if I were to sit here and tell you that the biggest and most profitable investment that you can make is in real estate, and I'm still a realtor in 30 years, then I probably haven't taken those same words of advice <laughs> yeah. to myself. I think- one of the things you said is people don't truly say what they really want, you know? Mm -hmm. And for me, I, and I, I, I just went out there and said, I do not want to be a realtor for the rest of my life. And I think that there's a lot of agents listening to this that, you know, you're using this cliche term of, I love working with people. I love selling houses, but what is, why are you selling these houses? What are you doing? Why are you doing all of this? Is it for your family? Is it to experience something? Is it to, you know, what is it? That, you know, why are you in this real estate profession? I think you have to, you know, take a step back and look at it and go, okay, I'm a realtor, but what do I really want in life? If you want to be a realtor for the rest of your life, that's great, but why? What is it allowing you to do that you can't do somewhere else? I was on a mastermind call last week and with about 10 agents across the country and we're talking about, you know, how we can make this mastermind better. And I go, look, let me, let, let, let me stop everybody here. I said, everybody's talking about how we can make this mastermind better so that way we can make more money so that way we can do the things that we want to do. What if we flipped it and I said, what if we taught everybody else how to make a mastermind better and we profited off of how to make a mastermind better because we're going through these issues right now. Would you guys still you know, want to do something like that. And they go, well, yeah, if the end goal was profit, so that what we can do, I guess it really works hand in hand. I said, you just got to think things differently. Some people think that I'm crazy, but I'm really just thinking things in a different way, which is what you're doing. And we're running short on time. I appreciate your time. Uh, we've talked about quite a bit of things here <laughs> that somebody's going to have to uh, rewind and listen and pause and uh, I want to make sure that for anybody that wants to reach out to you, where can they find you? Uh, if they have a message, if they want to experience something, truly experience something, and then allow Steve to uh, 10 times it, it really what that experience <laughs> could be. You know, please don't, please don't message him and say that you want to have a dinner in France because uh, that's not going to, that's not going to cut it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> where can people find you? So I'm pretty easy to find. I'm at Steve D. Sims, uh, S-I-M-S, -S, Steve D. Sims. I'm there on uh, Facebook, um, Instagram, Twitter, Steve D. Sims 1, and I've got a YouTube at uh, youtube.com, Steve D. Sims. So I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. But if you want to text the word Sims, S-I-M-S, -S, to 33777, you'd actually get uh, 33777, You'll actually get a, a PDF of my book and a few other things. So that's a pretty cool thing to do there. Yeah, that's Ooh. us texting it in. You're texting it in. <laughs> yeah, so that's going to be, uh, that's the easiest way. But Steve D. Sims, you'll find me. I'm, I'm the, the bald, scary guy. Sweet. Uh, with, with all the different things that we talked about, what's, what's the last piece of advice that you would want to give to somebody that, uh, using the word transparent, what's, what's one thing that they can do right now with their phone to make them stand out amongst the... The, the, the crowded noise of everybody else. Uh, pick up your phone, put it, uh, face it to you, click video, 
and just record a little video to a client, a vendor, a partner, anything, just expressing how you're trying to help them. You know, say to them, hey, uh, I know I haven't come back to you, but I'm still researching this because I want to come back to you with the best answer. Uh, don't take the fact that I haven't responded to your email as me just sitting here drinking pina coladas. I'll be back with you soon. Just something like that that lets these people know that you're actually in their mind and then text it to them. Don't email it to it. Text it to it. Why? Because no text has ever landed in your junk file because the junk file doesn't exist yet for text. So every text I've ever sent gets through. Not every email I've sent gets through, but your text still do. So use that phone, video it, tell someone you care and what you're up to and that you're still on the mind and text it to them. Sweet. Steve Sims, also known as Stems. Stim, yeah, my <laughs> new Stim. name. <laughs> uh, and remind everybody of the phone number once again. 33777. That's it. Steve Sims, author of Blue Fishing. Make sure to uh, reach out to him, and we will see you guys next week. Awesome. Bye. Bye. That was almost like a lamb. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, everybody, this is Jonathan Hawkins. Thank you so much for staying until the very end of this podcast. I definitely appreciate it. As always, make sure to reach out to me via social media at Jonathan Hawkins Official. Send me a comment. Shoot me a DM. If you have any questions, you can also comment below. Thank you so much. Don't forget to subscribe below. And remember, who you hire truly matters.